Chang, and I'm a postdoc uh, at CMTC, and I'll be chairing the next two talks. And um, uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Eric Baker from uh, Eindhoven Institute of Technology. And I think Dr. Baker is, um, is an expert in studying this nanowires and his research, you know, include not only this Mara nanowires, uh, I think which is a talk about today, but also the application of nanowires for realizing this uh, silicon germanium micro laser and also, you know, to achieve this better cell, uh, solar cell. And today his topic is about this reducing disorder in semiconductor, semiconductor nanowires. Uh, so I think Dr. Baker, the, the floor is yours. Dr. Baker, can you uh, share, start sharing the screen? And Hi, yeah, can you hear me? Oh uh, yes, yes. Very good. I'm trying to share. <laughs> I must say I'm more uh, used to using Teams instead of Zoom. I see. Oh, I just have a new laptop. I think I have to close actually uh, Zoom, so I will come back. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. But doesn't he just need to click on the green button? That's all, right? Uh, maybe he came across some technical issue with the room. Okay. Right? Oh, now he's now he's back. Yeah. Eric, there is a green button at the bottom. That says share screen. Oh, there it is. We can see your screen. Everything is fine. I see my screen. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, can you still see my screen? Yes, excellent. Okay, so let's start. So um, I will talk about reducing disorder in hybrid nanowires, so hybrid semiconductor superconductor nanowires. And I'm going to address actually most of the topics that were on Sankar's last slide. So we have disorder in these nanowire devices, and we are thinking about how can we reduce disorder. So I'm a material scientist, so I think about uh, epidexy, and I added the subtitle, which is uh, 6.4 angstrom epidexy, and this refers to the way in, um, in which Herbert Kramer would actually classif classify different types of semiconductors, so according to the lattice constants. And I will today talk about this family of the 6.4 angstrom uh, semiconductors. So first, I would like to uh, introduce the people who actually did the work. Um, so you can see a list of people from, uh, from my group. Um, so Reda Badawi, Marco Rossi, Sasha Ghazi Begovic, Roy Opert Feltz, Jason Jung, and Sander Schellinger. How did these people did the, most of the work? These are graduate students. And Marcel Vahey is doing the transmission electron microscopy in our group. But this is a, a collaboration also with the uh, University of Santa Barbara, the group of uh, Chris Palmstrom. And I will discuss a few transport experiments which are done in the group of uh, Leo Kauhoven at the Delft uh, University. Um, so this is the, let's say, the, the start of uh, the experimental part of, um, well, trying to find Majorana uh, states in, in, in devices. Um, so this is a picture of one of these devices where you can see a, a wire which consists of indium and timonite, and this addresses then and the one-dimensional system, it's in the metimonite, so it has a strong uh, spin over interaction, and it's coupled to a superconductor, and if we apply a magnetic field, you would expect to see zero bias states um, on this end of the wire and on this end of the wire. And by using tunneling spectroscopy, we have indeed found, let's say, the zero bias peak here. Well, this work was based on these proposals by, well, uh, well you all know these, these, these papers, so by uh, the Sarmas group and uh, uh, Felix van Oppen, and this paper was published now already, well, almost well, 10 years ago. And the big question is, um, why is it so difficult to find convincing evidence for these Majorana states? So, so far we are just discussing uh, signatures. 
So this is a picture that I got, I think, from uh, Vincent Maurik uh, around 10 years ago. Um, it's a similar device. So we have a nanowire here in green, which is coupled to a superconductor. We have normal contacts here in, um, in yellow or in gold. And then below this wire, you can see um, this keyboard of gates. So it's a very complicated device. And in such a device, we would like to see zero bias peaks or preferably Majorana states on the left side, uh, left hand side and on the right hand side. Now the question is, why, why haven't we seen strong evidence for these Majoranas? Uh, what you have to do now is you have to look to the energy skills, which were already mentioned by, uh, by Sankar. Uh, so we start with trivial wire and we hope to introduce a topological phase by using the Zeeman energy. So we apply a magnetic field and if we have a few Teslas, we may well first close the gap and then open the topological topological gap, which has a size of a few hundred micro electron volts. So that's actually a very small energy gap. And if we now think about this order in the system, um, we have to refer the energy scales of this disorder to the energy scale of this topological gap. Let's first start with uh, looking at the, um, the wire. So this is our semiconductor wire. And in these wires, we may have defects like planar defects, twin defects, or impurities. And these defects may have already energy scales, which are like tens of milli electron volts, but that is much bigger energy scales. In addition, such a wire has a lot of surface. Uh, well, by definition, I mean, it, it's surrounded by, by surface and on the surface, we may have uh, impurities, we may have uh, ions attached and the electrons in our channel may scatter actually on these impurities. And thirdly, um, in this wire, so this wire is a one dimensional system where we have uh, confinement in two directions. And if the diameter of the wire is not very constant, then the quantization energy may also vary along the length of the wire. And also these energy skills are quite substantial if you compare them to the topological gap. And so this is the semiconductor wire and let's dissect this device to a further extent. So here on top, we have the superconductor and in the superconductor, we may have grain boundaries or we may have defects. And maybe the superconductivity is not so sensitive, but it still adds disorder to the system. In addition, we may have thickness variations of the superconductor and the superconducting gap may vary actually with this thickness. And then we have the interface between the superconductor and the semiconductor. And what we did a few years ago is that we could open such a device with a focused ion beam. And then we can study this interface between the wire and the superconductor in more detail. So what you see here, this is the wire. It has a hexagonal cross-sectional shape, as you see here. And then around this wire, we have the superconductor, which in this case is niobium titanium nitride. And already just by looking at the contrast, you can see that the, the superconductor is polycrystalline. So you can see contrast, and that means that we have disorder. If we now zoom into this part of, um, of the structure, we can see here um, the wire. So this is the enium timonite in this case. You can see the crystal lattice. It looks quite okay. And here you can see the, uh, the superconductor. You can e even see the lattice fringes. So the superconductor is also crystalline. Uh, it all looks quite okay, but still there's a lot of disorder at this interface between the semiconductor and the superconductor. Yeah, so there's, uh, there's roughness. That, that's simply what you see here. And secondly, if the coupling between the superconductor and the semiconductor is too strong, we may metallize the semiconductor. And I will come back to this within a few slides. And then lastly, so we have this device here, which um, uh, consists of a semiconductor. We have a superconductor, we have normal metals, we have dielectrics, we have gate electrodes here. This, de this device has been fabricated at room temperature or it has been baked to a few hundred degrees centigrade. And then for measurements, we cool down to like well, tens of millikelvins. And all these materials, they may have very different thermal expansion coefficients. And well, it's well known for the semiconductors that if you have a few percent strain, that you can easily shift the, the, the bands by hundreds of milli electron volts. So these are huge energy variations, which you might have uh, in your device. And I think nobody yet started to think about the, these differences in thermal expansion coefficients of all these different materials. So in this talk, I would like to um, address at least an onset of how we can maybe start reducing 
this order in these kind of devices. And I'm a material scientist, so I like to think about how we can combine different materials and how we can use epidexy. And in this graph here, you can see, uh, well, many different semiconductors. On the y-axis, you can see the band gap energy. And on the x-axis, you can see the lattice constant here. And as mentioned already, we're going to discuss today here this 6.4 angstrom family. Yeah, so uh, our work is mainly based on imatimonide, which is here. And in purple, you can see actually the 3.5 semiconductors. And you can see that imatimonide is really very extreme. It has an extremely large lattice constant compared to all the other 3.5s, but also it has a very small band gap energy. And then in this greenish color, you can see another family of semiconductors, which are called the well, 2.6 uh, yeah, semiconductors. But for instance, cadmium telluride here. Um, and, and here we have lead telluride. Now here you can see more precisely the exact lattice constant of these, these materials. So this is inimitimonide, so it's 6.479 angstroms. And you can see that cadmium telluride has a very similar lattice constant. Um, and lead telluride is also quite near. And what we want to do now is we want to well, grow an inimitimonide wire and then to cap it with cadmium telluride for several reasons that will become clear during this talk. And so this is what I'm going to talk about. I will start with the growth of simple enium timonide nanowires, which were used for the first Myron experiments. Then I will extend the system. So I will add one shell. So then we have a core shell system, enium timonide, cadmium telluride. And then I will add another shell, which are the superconductors. Yeah, so then we have a core shell, shell system. Um, then I will switch to uh, in-plane nanowires. So the first wires are out of plane, growing vertically. And here I will switch to in-planes of horizontal nanowires. And if there is still time left, I will discuss lead telluride. So somebody asked, okay, are there semiconductors which have a stronger spin orbit coupling or a higher G factor? And I think lead telluride is such a semiconductor. Okay, something about the experiments that we're doing and our experimental setup. So this is our um, high vacuum MBE cluster in our clean room. Um, so let me start. So we did this long tube here. So this is an ultra high vacuum tube here. Uh, we can send in samples from this load lock here, uh, but we can also insert samples via this glove box here. That is this whitish box here. In the end, this is a glove box in which we have a load lock. Uh, and in this glove box, we can also store samples at low temperature under nitrogen. And then to this long vacuum tube, we have now four chambers connected. And let's start with this one. This is our 3.5 chamber. In this chamber, we can grow, in principle, all our 3.5s that we find of interest. But what is very important is that we also have an atomic hydrogen cleaning um, gun. So we have atomic hydrogen here, and we can, for instance, clean away oxides in this chamber. Then here we have what we call our 246 chamber. So in this chamber, we can grow our 246 materials. And also in this chamber, we have this atomic hydrogen gun. Then we go to the other side. Here we have our metals chamber in which we have um, well, different superconductors, so aluminum, lead, tin, um, but also a normal metal like platinum. And here we have a sample holder, which is connected to this liquid, liquid nitrogen tube. And we can cool this sample holder down to 120 Kelvin. And then the chamber, which was actually not yet on this photo, but here we have uh, chamber number four in which we have dielectrics. So when we have finished the uh, device fabrication uh, under ultra high vacuum, we can cap in principle the whole structure with a dielectric to protect it from well, getting polluted from uh, well water, for instance. Yeah, so now I will start with the growth of these enium wires, which is done by this vapor liquid solid growth mechanism, which was developed in the 60s. Uh, so we start with a catalyst particle, we use gold, we put this on the substrate, and then we put this uh, substrate in our growth machine. And when, uh, well, in the gas phase, we uh, supply the precursors, which, which dissolve in this metal particle, it becomes liquid, it becomes supersaturated. And at a certain moment, we start to grow uh, a wire underneath this, this metal particle. And as long as we have the right growth conditions, we, we grow this wire. And from this electron microscopy image, you can see the dimensions. So the diameter is like some tens of nanometers and the length, well, is actually determined by the growth time, but it can be as long as, as microns. 
And with this mechanism, we can grow in principle all semiconductors. So um, group four semiconductors, three fives, but also uh, two sixes. Yeah, so about 10 years ago, um, <laughs> Sergei Frolov and uh, Leo Kauhoven, they came to me. Uh, they were still working together. And they asked, okay, could you grow in metabolite for us? Because, well, we are interested in, in Majoranas and we need to have in metabolite wires. So we developed this, um, uh, this growth mechanism where we start with patterning gold particles uh, by using E-beam lithography. So we have an array of these gold particles. Um, and then first we grow um, a stem consisting of indium phosphide and then indium arsenide. And the reason for this is that uh, antimony has an extremely low surface energy and it tends to cover the complete substrate. So if we just start with exposing the sample to antimonite, it will simply cover the complete substrate as you can see here. So there will be a thick layer also embedding the gold particle. So what we do is we, we first grow indium phosphide and indium arsenide to lift off the gold particle away from the surface and then we switch to indium antimonite and then we can grow these wires. Yeah, And here we have a wire which has a length of well, two microns or so and a diameter of around 100 nanometers. Well, we can study these wires in transmission electron microscopy. We can look for defects. So this is an overview image of such a wire. And well, um, in principle, you don't see any contrast. And that means that there are no planar defects in these wires. We can zoom in, we can go to higher resolution. And here you can see the atomic structure. So you can see the uh, well, crystal structure of this wire. And from the symmetry, we know that this, this wire has the zinc blended crystal structure. I mentioned already that we have no defects. Uh, well, we can see these dumbbells and we can go to higher resolutions and then we can actually resolve these dumbbells. And then it appears that this atom here is indium, for instance, and this atom is uh, antimony. And that means that the top facet of the wire um, is terminated by antimony and the bottom facet of the wire is terminated by indium. And these wires, they grow in this one, one, one direction. And that means that they grow in this one, one B direction yeah, because it's terminated by antimony. Um, well, important to mention is that these wires, by nature, they have these atomically flat 110 facets. And they are really atomically flat all along the wire. So if you think about the quantization energy in the system, um, that, that also must be very uniform. So now some uh, transport. Um, a few years ago, we fabricated these devices, a so simple field effect transistor devices, just to estimate the mobility. Um, so this is the wire with two ohmic contacts and the spacing between these contacts here is two microns to be sure that we are in the diffusive limit. Um, we take the transconductance, which looks like this, and then we can fit a model. And from this model, then we can estimate the mobility. Well, a very important ingredient is the capacitance here, which is actually unknown, but we calculate and we estimate uh, that it should be like in this range, which is indicated by this figure here. Well, now two things. If we just do this measurement directly after cooling down, we find a mobility which is around 10,000 or so, if you take the average of these dark data points. And if we actually pump down the device uh, like three days before we cool down, then the mobility is increased by, well, by about a factor of two. And that means that there are some things surrounding these wires which limit the mobility. And we think that this is simply water. So water is has condensed on, on, the, on the device just by exposing this to ambient air and water or maybe ions in this water um, take care of scattering of the electrons in this channel and uh, that reduces the mobility in the system. Yeah, so it's very important to think about, okay, what happens at the surface of these nanowires. Um, so this was actually for a long channel, so like two microns. We can reduce this, this channel length and we can use like a high quality dielectric, so boron nitride. And what we then observe is the following. So instead of seeing this gradually increasing uh, current between the source and the drain, we see an increase of the current, then we see a plateau, increase of the current, and then a plateau again. And so this shows that we have quantized conductance in this system if we have a short channel here. Uh, so this shows that we have ballistic transport and the mean free path is like a few hundred nanometers. Uh, well, we estimate this to be like 300 nanometers. Secondly, it shows that we can have access in the system to these one-dimensional subbands. So actually already around zero gate potential. So if we don't apply any gate, we are 
looking here at um, a single subband in the system. Um, yeah, I mentioned that for the growth of these wires, we use a stem, a stem of indium phosphide, or even uh, we add indium arsenide. And there are two co consequences. And the first one is that this stem actually evaporates during the growth of the indium and timonite. And so here we switch to indium and timonite, we start to grow. And here you can see that the indium phosphide stem gets thinner and thinner. And at a certain moment, it will simply, well, the top wire will simply break off, it will fall down. And then the indium and timonite also stops growing. And this mechanism uh, limits the, the maximum length of these wires to, well, to about two or three microns. And as Sankra mentioned, we need to have longer wires in order to separate these Majorana states further. So what we did, actually we optimized or we changed the, the growth mechanism. So now we, we use an indium and timonite substrate. We use a mask of silicon nitride. And by controlling the mask opening here very exactly and controlling the shape of this gold particle, we were able to grow these wires without a stem. And so now we directly start to grow with indium and timonite. And in principle, we can grow them forever. Um, okay, but practically we are limited, of course, by the growth time. And I think the longest wires that we have grown have a length of about 60 microns or so. And again, these wires have an untapered shape. So the uh, diameter of the wire is very, very uniform. And a question we also had is, how about the purity of these wires? What is happening here? So if we do have the stem, then this indium phosphide, it evaporates and this phosphorus, and sometimes we also have arsenic that may be incorporated in the uh, indium and timonite. And that also leads to disorder, of course, in the system. So now the question is what happens to the purity of the system if we go from this, well, from these stemmed wires to these stemless wires. And for this, we used atom probe tomography. So we peel off atom by atom, and then we use a mass spectrometer in which we can analyze the nature of these atoms that we have peeled off. So in these graphs, you can see the atomic concentration on the y-axis, it's on a log scale versus the uh, position in the wire. And we have studied this for these stemmed wires and for the stemless wires. Let's start with the uh, wires with a stem. So here we find um, antimony and indium at about a 50-50 ratio, which would expect of course but then in addition we also find phosphorus and arsenic and arsenic has a concentration of a few percent here even so quite high concentrations of arsenic and well important to mention is that these wires they have a length of well about two microns here this is the maximum length that we could obtain uh, by them and here on the right you can see um, actually the data for the stemless wires Again, we have indium and antimony here, again, at about a 50-50 ratio. And now you can see that arsenic and phosphorus are present, but in a much lower concentration. So the arsenic has dropped by, well, what is it? Uh, about four orders of magnitude here. So now we have much lower arsenic uh, pollutions in these samples. And also phosphorus has dropped by about, well, two orders of magnitude. And so we have much, much less arsenic and phosphorus now in these wires. So how does that uh, work out for the mobility? So uh, to study that, we have fabricated exactly the same devices. So with the same channel length, the same thickness of the dielectric, and we have, we have used exactly the same model to fit our transconductance curves. And as you can see here now, we have increased the mobility to about well, 40,000. So we started at 10,000, then we did pumping, then we went to 20,000. And now by removing arsenic and phosphorus from the system, we have doubled again here the mobility and now we are at about 40,000. So it's, it's high for, for nanowires, but if you compare this to uh, two decks, for instance, it's still pretty low. So I think the, the bulk mobility of indium and timonite at room temperature, it's like 70, 77,000. Um, so even this low temperature mobility is lower uh, than that mobility. So the question now is what is at this moment limiting the, the electron mobility? And we think it's actually scattering at the nanowire surface. So as mentioned before, the, these nanowires, they have a huge surface area compared to the, uh, well, to the channel or the surface is always very close to the channel. And we believe that this surface scattering is now very important. So for this, we are now 
studying this system where we first grow an indium intimonide nanowire and then we kept the wire with cadmium telluride. Yeah, so this is how the wires look. So, well, they look very similar to just the, the bare wires. Um, well, we did some DFT calculations in order to find the conduction band offset for this particular interface. So now these wires, they have these, these flat 110 side facets, and we wanted to study uh, the band offset between the indium timonite and the cadmium telluride in this system. So we have done these DFT calculations together with the group of uh, Silvana Botti and Thomas Rauch is the postdoc who helped us a lot. And this is uh, basically the result. Um, so this is the indium and timonite um, structure. So conduction band, valence band. Here we have the um, cadmium telluride conduction band, uh, valence band offset. Uh, so we have a type one band offset and most of the offset is, is actually in the, in the valence band as you can see here. And the offset in the conduction band here is about 0.3 uh, electron volts. And um, well, also important to mention is that cadmium telluride and indium antimonide have, well, next to having a very similar lattice constant, they also have a very similar thermal expansion coefficient, which is helpful, of course. Yeah. So now we studied how can we actually grow a nice apotextual shell around these wires. And on this slide, you can see the first TM data, which was an unsuccessful uh, first trial. Um, in this graph here on the top left, you can see here um, indium timonite in the middle. And then here on the outside, we have cadmium telluride. But you can see that here in the middle, we have a dark contrast. Yeah, so you can see this in this uh, normal projection. We can also make a cross-sectional cut of these wires. And then here in the middle, you can see indium timonite. Here we have the cadmium telluride. We can zoom in uh, at this corner here. That is that corresponds to this image here. You can see, I think, hopefully the uh, periodicity of the lattice, which is continued from the core into the shell. And the same actually for uh, this part here. Also, you can see that the lattice is continued from the core into the shell. So there's clearly, clearly a epitaxy happening, but you can also see this dark contrast. And we believe that this dark contrast is actually due to having some um, well, interrupted oxide layer still at the interface. So what we do is we, we grow the indium timonite wires in an MOVPE, and then we transfer these wires still in a nitrogen into our MBE, where we hydrogen clean off this, this oxide layer. But apparently the, the anneal was not completely successful here. So we still have some residual oxide here. Uh, so some islands of oxide. And uh, well, in between these islands, we can still have nice epitaxial growth, but due to these islands, we also have this contrast. And another consequence of having this oxide is that we do have these defects in the shell. And so this is the, the core, and this is the shell. And in the shell, you can see that we have these, these twin layers. You can see here, if we zoom in, you can see here these, these defects. Uh, some are even connected. And uh, well, these twins are probably bad news if you think about this order in the in the sample okay this was the first attempt we simply optimized this um, oxide annealing by this hydrogen exposure and on this slide you can see the results so it's, this is an overview of one of these wires it's a core shell wire uh, this is a dark field image um, so believe me it, it should contain indium timonite and a cadmium telluride shell but you don't see any contrast. So even if we zoom in, so here we have uh, atomic resolution, so you can see the crystal planes, but you don't see any contrast between the indium timonite and the cadmium telluride. And the reason is that if you look to the, um, well, part of the periodic system, which I depicted here, um, then here you can see um, the row in which we find these elements. So here we have indium, here we have antimonide, and the average, mass here or average atomic number is 50 and here we have cadmium and here we have tellurium and also the average atomic number of cadmium telluride is 50. So that means that we cannot expect to have any Z contrast in this dark field imaging. Well luckily we can also do uh, EDX imaging so energy dispersive of x-ray analysis and with this we can actually uh, distinguish these different chemical elements. So now here in the center you can see the indium timonide 
you can see that we have a very thin shell here of cadmium telluride. And I think you can also see that this shell here is quite uniform. Now we can image these wires along two different uh, directions as given here in these images on the right. So we can image along this facet here. Uh, so then we kind of project, let's say, uh, all along this facet. But we can also look just to this corner facet here of the wire. And of course, if there's any roughness, we are, well, it's more easy to see this along this projection compared to this projection. And in this graph here, hopefully you can also see this atomic resolution. You can see that the outer facet here is pretty sharp. And another thing that is obvious here is that there is no amorphous layer. So the cadmium telluride also doesn't oxidize, it seems. So we can cut open these wires. We can make these cross-sectional views. Um, um, this is a dark field image. We can go to high resolution. There's no contrast now. The lattice is continued. And also in this view, we have a very uniform and thin shell of cadmium telluride, cadmium telluride, telluride around this wire. Um, yeah, so we have a very uniform shell. We have a sharp interface, um, but we don't see any contrast in this um, image. So that also means that there's no strain and we have, no, uh, we have not found any defects in the TM. Then we went to our colleagues in, uh, in Groningen. They have access to this high-end transmission electron microscope. Um, so they can image at very high resolution. But moreover, they can also take EDX spectra at every pixel in this, um, in this image. So they have scans uh, along this image and they have taken EDX spectra all over the place. And then we can actually take, or we can energy filter these spectra and we can look, for instance, for the position of indium atoms or antimony atoms. <clears throat> and this is then the, the picture that you get. So here you can see indium and antimonide. So you can see the dumbbells. Um, and we can do the same for cadmium and tellurium. So also here you can see the dumbbells. And what we did next is we integrated over this uh, rectangle here along this 111b direction. And then we can find actually the positions of these atoms. Yeah, so here you can see the, the indium atoms, the antimonides. Um, and you can see that there is a small offset here. And we can do the same for the cadmium and the tellurium um, atoms, um, which you can see here. So here we have the cadmiums, here we have the telluriums. And now we can compare actually these, these positions of these atoms. And what you see is that these cations, so the indiums and the cadmiums are aligned, and also the anions are aligned, so the antimonides and the telluriums. Now, so that means basically that the polarity in the crystal is maintained. So if we go from indium antimonide to cadmium telluride, so we have perfect epitaxy. And moreover, there is no oxide at, the, at this interface. <clears throat> yeah, so we haven't found any oxide between the indium antimonide and the cadmium telluride, but also no oxide on the outer uh, surface. So we have studied this growth mechanism in a bit more detail. So you can see the thickness of the cadmium telluride as a function of the time. Um, well, these, these shells are grown at a quite low temperature. And what is happening is that this cadmium telluride, it, it lands on the surface of the inimitimonite. And because of the low temperature, it doesn't diffuse around. So it forms these islands. And that's what you can see actually in these TM images, especially if you image along this corner facet here, you can see that this outer layer here is interrupted. So we have islands of cadmium telluride. And in this outer layer, we have these holes. And in this hole, we have an amorphous layer, which is actually the oxidized indium antimonide. Yeah, so the growth starts here with forming or well, with the formation of these islands. And if we then increase the growth time, we close this film, and then we get a very nice uniform layer of cadmium telluride. And well, you can see that the uh, cadmium telluride thickness increases with time. Um, this also means that um, it's difficult to just grow very thin layers because it starts with, with these islands and it's not a uniform layer. So just by growth, we cannot make very thin layers. Um, I'll come back to this later. 
And another remark that I want to make is that the, so, so we have made devices out of this and we have estimated the mobility of the electrons in this channel. And so far we have not seen an increase. So the mobility is very similar to the bare wires. And actually it makes sense because if you think about quantum wells, uh, in order to, to get these super high mobility two decks, you also need a capping layer to move away the surface. And the thickness of this capping layer is also typically like 50 or 100 nanometers. So probably also in order to, to reach higher mobilities, we also need to go to much thicker uh, shells. So that is next on the agenda. But for us, this, this cadmium telluride layer actually has two functions. So one is passivation, and therefore we have to make these thicker layers. But the other one is to actually tune the coupling between the semiconductor and the superconductor. So what I will discuss next is to grow superconductors on the wire. And it seems to be very important to tune the coupling between the semiconductor and the superconductor. So on this slide, you can see some graphs from a paper which is published by the group of uh, Jelena Klinovaya in Basel. And they have studied actually these well, system parameters as a function of the coupling between the semiconductor and the superconductor. Yeah, so they have, they have studied the induced gap in the semiconductor. They have studied the um, spin orbit energy and the G factor as a function of the coupling parameter. So these coupling parameters, are this, uh, so, so these are results from a tight binding model. And this TS is actually the hopping constant in the superconductor. <clears throat> and if it's one, it means that we have the superconductor properties. And if it's zero, then we have the semiconductor properties. Now, first of all, if we have strong coupling, then we metallize the semiconductor. So what happens is that due to the high electron density in the superconductor, we actually uh, raise the chemical potential in the, in the semiconductor. And it means that the chemical potential is high up in the conduction band. And we start to populate all these 1D channels. And as a result, we are not anymore in the 1D limit, but we are more like in a bulk limit. So that is a first problem. And secondly, in these systems where, where people have grown uh, the superconductors epitaxially on the semiconductor, um, we are in this strong coupling limit. And we know that by looking at the induced uh, superconducting gap in the semiconductor. So this is a graph where we have this induced gap as a function of this, this coupling parameter. And <clears throat> what we find in these experiments is that the induced gap is of a very similar size as the bulk gap of the superconductor. So that means that we must be above like, well, 0.2 in this graph. And if we are above 0.2, it also means that the spin orbit energy is much, much lower than what you would find in the bulk semiconductor. And it's really like an order of magnitude, uh, magnitude lower. And the same actually for the G factor also here. So if we are like in this regime here, so in the strong coupling regime, also the G factor is much, much lower than what you would expect uh, from the semiconductor by itself. So that means that if we are in this strong coupling regime, that it will be very difficult to well reach this topological phase. And we would now like to reduce this coupling by using this tunnel barrier of cadmium telluride. Yeah. So now in this graph, we actually um, calculated the proximatized gap as a function of the cadmium telluride shell thickness for two different systems. So one where, where we have aluminum and one where we have lead. These estimations were done actually by J. Sao uh, by using this, this conduction band offset by the coherence length, by the uh, effective masses, the lifetimes. Um, and then we got these calculations. And um, well, aluminum has a build gap of around 0.3 uh, milli electron volts. Lead has a much bigger gap around 2.5 uh, milli EV. So that's why we're all also interested in lead. And what you can see now is that in order to have, um, well, let me go back to this slide. So in order to find, let's say the good properties, we need to have uh, a coupling, which is well below this 0.1 in this graph. Then we have like a reasonable spin orbit energy and we have maintained like uh, a reasonable uh, G factor. 
And if you then look at this graph, if we are below 0.1 here, that means that we would expect to have like 20% uh, of the, the bill gap. Yeah, so we should have an induced gap, which is like less than 20% of the bill gap. So if we now switch back to this slide, it means that if we would like to have 20% of this gap, it would be, uh, well, that would mean that we need a shell thickness of around about 2.5 nanometers or so. Uh, well, somewhere between 2.5 and 3.5 nanometers. And for lead, if we go back to 20% um, of the gap, that would be like, well, somewhere between uh, 1.8 or so and 2.5. So these are the shell thicknesses that we are aiming for. So between 1.8 and 3.5 nanometers. Now we'll go back a few slides uh, where I discussed the growth here. And I just mentioned here, I think that it's very difficult actually to reach these very thin uh, shells with cadmium telluride because of this problem that we form uh, islands. Um, yeah, so we developed a trick here. And that is that we first grow now a very thick shell of cadmium telluride. And then we actually etch it back by using atomic hydrogen. And we found that this etching is actually a very nice mechanism. So it seems to etch away the cadmium telluride layer by layer. And it results in very flat layers of cadmium telluride. So in this graph, you can see the etched thickness as a function of the etching time. And you can see what happens if we have, um, if we start with different thicknesses, well, you can see that it decreases linearly in time. Um, we can image these samples. So this is, let's say, our starting point when we have a very thick cadmium telluride shell. It looks very uniform along this projection angle. Uh, well, we can see some roughness if we only image here the, the corner facet. Here we have exposed the sample to, uh, well, a certain period to this hydrogen, atomic hydrogen. You can see that the uh, cadmium telluride layer has decreased in thickness and it has stayed very, very flat here. And if we expose it for a very long time to atomic hydrogen, then we can completely remove here the cadmium telluride shell. And then we start to see that the indium terminide oxidizes again. Yeah, so this is a way to very precisely tune here the thickness of the cadmium telluride uh, tunnel barrier. Then the next step is to deposit the superconductors on top. And if we grow wires, then besides wires, we also have these flakes, which have this triangular shape. And in our MBE, we can deposit the aluminum from a certain angle. Um, so the, the deposition of the superconductor is directional. And what you see here is that certain uh, structures actually shadow the deposition for structures standing behind. So for instance, here on this flake here, you can see the aluminum being deposited here and here, but here the deposition is interrupted just by the fact that this wire is standing in front here. And so with a wire, we can shadow a flake, but alternatively, we can also uh, shadow a wire with a flake. And so we can also find wires here where we have aluminum here deposited on the core shell wire, but there is no aluminum here at the bottom. Yeah, so now we can study these wires in more detail in the TEM. Um, so this picture confirms that we have indium metamonide here in the core, then we have a very thin shell of cadmium telluride. It has a thickness here of 2.5 nanometers. Then we have aluminum, and then we have a thin layer of aluminum oxide. And here in high resolution, you can see that the cadmium telluride is crystalline. The aluminum is crystalline, although it has been deposited at 120 Kelvin, it still forms a single crystal. Um, and it also has an epitaxial relation to the cadmium telluride. So what we see here are the two OO planes, which are inclined with this angle of 24 degrees with respect to the 101 planes in the indium and timonide. Um, but it has a nice epitaxial uh, relation. And at this moment, we are studying the transport and we have first indications that we do see a uh, gap in the indium and timonide and that the gap size has indeed reduced with respect to the uh, to the bill gap, I think I'm running short in time, so I will actually skip many many slides, and I will end with lead telluride. So these are just two or three slides. Um, so lead telluride 
has a band gap, which is quite small. It's like 0.3 electron volts, an effective mass, which is even smaller than that of any metimonide. Um, the spin orbit coupling is not yet known, but the G factor is higher than that of any metimonide. And what is maybe most important is that it has an enormously high dielectric constant of like 1300. And this is like a factor of 100 bigger than that of, let's say, these other uh, semiconductors. And that means that if you have like a charged uh, defect or an, a charged impurity, that the field of this impurity is very effectively screened. And these are some results from the group in um, Regensburg, where they have made lead telluride um, two decks in which they have measured this quant uh, well, quant quantized conductance. And already at four Kelvin, they can see these super nice plateaus. And also these experiments are very, very reproducible. And well, in this paper, they explain that this is all due to the fact that all these impurities, which they have, are very effectively screened by this super high dielectric constant in this material. So we started to grow wires based on lead telluride. And you can see the first results. So this is an example of such a wire. It has, well, it has no defects, so it's, it's defect free. You can see that by the absence of any contrast in the wire. Um, uh, also here in the diffraction pattern, you can see that it's, it's defect free. It has the rock salt crystal structure, which you can also see from this image. Um, in this image, you can also see that these wires, the bare wires are sensitive for oxidation. So uh, it forms this oxide layer on the surface, uh, which is not so nice. But what is nice is that lead telluride has very similar lattice constants to indium and timonite. So we can now actually use all the features that we have developed for indium and timonite also for lead telluride. And so we can cap these wires with cadmium telluride, for instance. And you can see one of the first images that we have taken. So this is the lead telluride. I think you can recognize here the cubic crystal structure. And this is then the cadmium telluride uh, shell. What we're studying now is uh, what happens at this interface because lead telluride has the rock salt crystal structure, whereas cadmium telluride is zimblende. So maybe we have some uh, buildup of charge at this interface. And then I think this is the final slide. Uh, I think this is also very important. So if we have, if we compare this system to iniumetimonide with aluminum, then the aluminum tends to react with the iniumetimonide because aluminum and timonide is, is a very stable compound. And that means that the interface between that semiconductor and that superconductor is by definition not stable. Now, in this case, we can actually use lead as a superconductor and grow that on lead telluride. And well, uh, lead, of course, doesn't react with lead telluride. But this is an overview of such a wire where we have here lead telluride, and then here we have the lead uh, shell. We can zoom in. And I must say that I've never seen such a nice and flat interface. So this is the lead telluride, this is the lead, and well, you can see that it's, it's a super clear and sharp interface between the semiconductor and the superconductor. Um, so this order is very minimal at this interface. And now we can also look to the outer interface, so between the lead and the vacuum. And here we, we form a lead oxide, which is crystalline. And it also results in a very flat interface, actually, between the lead and the outside world. Yeah, so I think this is a very promising system because, well, lead telluride has this high G factor. Uh, lead has a large superconducting gap. And there seems to be very little disorder in the system. So to finalize, um, so we use these VLS, so these out-of-plane indium timonide wires to explore new features, which we can easily study in transport and in TEM. I didn't discuss at all because of time restrictions, this selective area work where we also work on indium timonide. And I've shown these, well, uh, first results on lead telluride. And in the near future, we are going to study these asymmetric shells where we have the wire here in the middle, then we will have a thick shell here for passivation in order to have uh, well, uh, high mobility in the channel. And then here, hopefully, we can tune the coupling between the superconductor and the semiconductor. Before I end, I would like to thank the people who did the work. So Reda uh, Badawi, she has been responsible for the growth of these stemless wires together with uh, Sasha Ghazi Bekovic. Um, Roy and Jason did the work on the selective area growth of the indium timonide. And I should mention Sandra here, 
who did the first growth of this uh, of these lead wires. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot for this very nice talk. And uh, uh, Shankar, do you have a question? Yes, I do. In fact, Eric, I have two questions. Well, I have many questions, but I'm going to ask two. The rest I can ask them through email. One is from the first part of your talk and one is from the last part. First part is in the indium antimonide uh, system, you showed uh, mobility, which increased from you know, 7,000 to 40, 45,000, very good improvement. Uh, to do that, you needed to know something about the carrier density, doping density. I mean, do you know the typical doping density in these wires and what is the Fermi energy and so on? Well, that is a bit of a chicken egg problem. So we do this modeling and we don't know the carrier density uh, and we don't know the mobility and we don't know the capacitance. Right. So actually in a similar experiment where we also grow these flakes. Yes. So on the flake, which is grown, let's say, under exactly the same conditions as these wires, we can use these flakes to do a, a quantum hole uh, measurement or hole uh, measurement. Yes. And from this, then we can estimate the carrier density and the mobility in much more detail. And it actually agrees to these experiments. Okay, so what is the typical carrier density if you convert that to corresponding 1D density? I understand once you put it on the wire, it may be very different. I understand all those things. But just to get some idea. I think it's uh, 10 to the 17 or so. 10 to the 17 per uh, cubic centimeter, you mean, right? Yep. That's, a three, that's a 3D density, right? Roughly. Okay, good. Uh, and now the last part, lead telluride, which I totally agree with you, looks very promising from the pictures you uh, showed. Uh, uh, you know, I haven't read your paper yet, but I will very soon. Uh, but one important question here uh, is uh, some idea about the spin orbit coupling, right? If spin orbit coupling is very small, then these other good things would not do that much for us. So my question is, is there any, do you have any idea even within a factor of three or four? Or is somebody measuring it? Uh, what is the status? I have no idea. But since, let's say, these, these, uh, this material consists of very heavy elements, I expect yeah. a very strong spin orbit coupling. Yeah. I think the atomic coupling will be very strong. And that's what I'm hoping, that you, you may not even need kind of a rush by effect. You know, it just may be very large. OK, but you don't know any measured value yet. We all it's hope not it reported yet. Yeah. yeah. But this is something I think that once you have the wear, someone like Leo could estimate it from his kind of measurement he did before, right? I mean, in principle, this is not a difficult measurement, right? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, for sure, we're going to do this, yeah. Yeah, it's a very high priority, I would say. You know, if the spin orbit coupling is also large, we should drop all the other systems and run to this system. Yes, I agree. <laughs> all right, yeah, and thank you very much. Very nice talk. I, I really have some idea now. Thanks. Okay, any other questions? Um, if not, maybe I, I can ask a very naive question. Uh, basically, I think you mentioned uh, in some of your slides that uh, uh, the, the matching of the thermal expansion coefficient seems to be a, a, a important factor in growing this uh, in these uh, heterostructures. Uh, I think my, my 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 naive question is like you know in because uh, if we if we further want to put a, you know to grow this uh, superconductor part in an epitaxial way. Do you think that that is also an important factor in terms of the to matching the thermal expansion coefficient in this case? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. I think nobody really thought about these thermal expansion coefficients, uh, but um, I can imagine that that if you cool down this device, that you get many uh, strains actually uh, exerting on, on, the, on the device. And it's also very non-uniform. Um, so I think that's very bad news. So hopefully if we can get this wire, Mm -hmm. with, a, with a thick shell, which is lattice matched and which has the same thermal expansion coefficient, we can kind of shield the wire mechanically from these external strains. I see, I see. Because I just did a very good, very quick Google search about the, the thermal expansion coefficient for the aluminum and for the indium arsenide, and it seems to be to differ by like uh, maybe uh, uh, a factor of four or something. <laughs> so That's maybe. Huge. Yeah. Uh, I see. I see. But that could be something that we. Um, that makes this uh, this uh, lead telluride uh, you know nanowire more promising, right? They, because they all they, they all can, can uh, you know include the same uh, uh, this uh, this uh, element of lead, right? Yeah. For instance, one idea we have is to use uh, tin actually as a superconductor. Mm -hmm. uh, so here you can see the indium and and the cadmium telluride, and tin is actually uh, exactly in the middle, and it yes. has the same lattice constant also as these materials. Uh, the only problem is that tin has two phases, so an alpha and a beta phase. 
Mm -hmm. And the point is to get it in the right superconducting phase. Yes. But that's one of the ideas uh, we have. I see, I see. Thank you. And also maybe a, a, a slightly minor question because I, I, I remember that the left telluride, if I remember correctly, it was uh, initially proposed as a, as a, as a topological science later, if I remember correctly. So do you think that that will like uh, make it, make it may, will help in, in, in realizing this Majorana physics here in this nanowire structure? Ah, okay, so there are two materials. So there's a uh, tin telluride and lead telluride, and it seems that yes. tin telluride is this topological crystal and insulator, but lead telluride is trivial, I think. Oh, I see, I see, yeah. Okay, thanks Paul, for, for, for correcting that. Yeah. Okay, uh, any other questions? If not, maybe we can uh, take like a three minutes break and before we move on to the, to the next talk. And uh, thank you again for uh, giving us a wonderful talk, Eric. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. And Dr. Dagger, maybe you can try to start sharing your screen just to see if it works. Does that look? Yeah, it's looking perfect. Okay, so uh, so our next speaker is uh, Dr. Nagar from uh, um, uh, Neosport Institute, and uh, Dr. Nagar is an expert on both uh, you know these quantum nanowires and also quantum dots. And I think he's recently interested in this uh, how different topological phenomena can arise from these uh, lower dimensional systems. And uh, today uh, he will be talking about these uh, hyper hybrid uh, nanowires, uh, uh, dots, and bond state towards topological devices. And Dr. Nagar, you, you can start whenever you are ready. All right, let's let's get started. Um, first, let me thank you uh, a lot for the invitation, Changa, to speak at this uh, this conference. It's, it's quite exciting, uh, interesting mix of, of subjects. Um, as my title indicates, I will also try to cover both some material science and and transport. Uh, I'm from the Nils Bohr Institute in Copenhagen. Uh, it was actually founded exactly 100 years ago, last month. Um, and I belong to the so-called Center for Quantum Devices, uh, along with the colleagues that were mentioned uh, earlier today. I will not uh, acknowledge all the funding uh, agencies, but uh, since it's a historical year, I will just show uh, um, the first grant application um, submitted by Niels Bohr uh, 110 years ago. Uh, it looked quite a lot simpler than what we had to write these years, but that was uh, the grant that allowed him to, to go for a postdoc in the UK and 
uh, to work with Royal Ford and, and think about the atomic model. Um, by the way, it was um, addressed to the Carlsberg Foundation, which continues today to be a, a sponsor for research and a producer of beer, as you may know. Good, let's continue with the, uh, the science part. So, um, um, regarding wires for topological research and wireanas, it's, uh, it's of course clear that, that 1D wires is not the only platform and maybe not the one you want at the, uh, at the end to, to when it comes to making more complicated systems. So um, while the, the, the 1D wires shown on the left-hand side are interesting for as a model system and for the fundamental research, it's pretty clear we need to move to uh, to high dimensional 2D systems for, for more complex circuits. Nevertheless, today, uh, just like the previous speaker, I will only talk about 1D wires grown bottom up, um, uh, since that's my main area of, of research, uh, but, but here the very exciting developments going on also in the, in the 2D area. Uh, in today's uh, introduction, in the first, Dr. Shankar mentioned this development of the uh, epitaxial superconductors on Three five nanowires that was important for, for realizing the first experiments with a, a hard cap and such. And uh, I just spoke as a recap. I show on the left hand side the first wires grown in, in our lab in 2014 or 15. Um, the idea was conceived by Thomas Jespersen, an associate professor, uh, a PhD student, Morten Vassen made the first growths. And there's actually a team of people, uh, and of course. Uh, largely Peter Krostop, who ended and, and developed these highly refined uh, indium arsenide wires with epitaxial layers of aluminum uh, on the side, grown by molecular beam epitaxy. So these materials uh, allowed us to perform spectroscopy to, to say, see this rather uh, so-called heart uh, induced gap, which facilitated a lot of experiments in the years that followed. But of course, aluminum is not the only material. I give a few examples on the right-hand side. Uh, of other superconductors that can be grown on the nanowires, uh, just for illustration. Uh, niobium is known also for a lot of the uh, indium antimonide nanowire work. Uh, it's a more amorphous material. It doesn't make quite a nice interface that we get between aluminum and indium arsenide. But there are other materials that work. For instance, tantalum is nanocrystalline. It's not perfect, but it does actually give rise to a hard gap uh, if one performs a spectroscopy on, on these devices. And that serves to illustrate that actually an epitaxial match is not necessarily a requirement for getting a hard gap, uh, as long as the interface is uh, free from impurities and, and uniform, uh, it works quite nicely. Uh, towards the end of the talk, I'll, I'll get back to, uh, to, to discuss some of the other superconductors that can be that play uh, these years. Um, Eric showed, the, uh, the previous speaker, Eric Barger showed uh, impressive uh, molecular beam epitaxy set up in, in Eindhoven. Our system is somewhat simple, um, but as an experimentalist, it's, it's nice to show some hardware, just like a few ways which show uh, equations. Uh, this is our AMB system uh, on the left-hand side, the chamber for growing the free five nanowires. Uh, and attached to this one, uh, the UHV transfer system is a metallization chamber that allows us to put the superconductors, for instance, at the um, surfaces of the nanowires um, and do that uh, deposition at low temperatures, which turns out to be crucial for obtaining the nice uh, crystalline interfaces. Both Shankar and Eric pointed out a lot of the issues and what one faces when making the uh, uh, presumably op optimal devices for, for studies of, of topological features. Uh, and there's a long list of, of uh, problems, challenges that, that must be addressed. I put some of them here, um, both regarding the, the superconducting shell. We already heard a bit about that. It may be granular, et cetera. It has an interface to the semiconductor that is crucial. The semiconductor itself, is important, for instance, even single impurities can play a role as I believe you will hear in the last talk today um, by Tudor uh, Stanesco. Uh, one also needs to worry about damage from processing of devices, how to stabilize and passivate the surfaces and utilization issues. Um, I cannot solve them all, but I'll address some of these today um, in my talk. And that brings, us, uh, brings me to, to the outline of, of the talk 
uh, the title uh, hybrid nanowires refers to, as you see now, to bottom up grown 1D semiconductor superconductor wires. I would like to, like to talk a bit about impurities in the more ideal sense of quantum dots, dots coupled uh, to the nanowire, nanowires and, and the topologic superconductor. Uh, I would like to discuss some of the bound states that may arise uh, in this coupling. Could be Andreev states or Shiba states, as we heard about in the ASTM talk. Uh, and of course, it's all aimed towards making topological devices, but I'll not demonstrate any signature uh, of topology on my runners today in my talk. That's, that's not my target. Uh, I'll address uh, three items that uh, Shankar asked me to talk about. Uh, I'll talk a bit about the hybrid nanowire platform, how to improve this very much along the lines that Eric Bargas explained in the previous uh, lecture. Uh, then I would like to address some of the bound states found when coupling superconducting islands to quantum dots, for instance, accidental quantum dots uh, that may form uh, in the signal conducting part of such devices. And finally, I will just like Eric, uh, look at lead as a superconductor in these uh, super semi devices. Now, I said that uh, 1D wires is a limitation. Uh, it's, of course, true. Uh, it's a, probably a linear system that can be realized. But even with the wires, one can build more complex uh, devices. He has shown some concepts, uh, theoretical proposals within the realm of uh, topological devices that involves wires that are somehow coupled to make more complex systems. Um, Elena Kinovaya and Daniel Loss has, has worked on proposals for realizing so-called parafermions. It's a more like fractional Majorana particles that one may dream about creating in, uh, in double wires coupled by a superconductor that allows a cross and gray reflections between the two systems. One can also study Majorana and double wires and, and tune the topological threshold uh, by playing with the interference between the two systems. There are issues like the topological contour effect that could possibly be realized if one can couple two Majorana wires uh, with a superconducting island. And even for topological qubits, two wire systems are sometimes needed, for instance, when coupling a Majorana box qubit to a quantum dot for projected readout and such. Uh, so the first example I will give on of uh, non-trivial uh, materials is actually such uh, double wires that we have realized in the lab. We grow our wires just as A. Vargas explained in a previous talk from catalyst particles of gold on a substrate. And if you place them carefully, you can actually get very well-defined patterns on the substrate. We are shown uh, two schematic uh, drawings of how one may make a parallel nanowires. Uh, the upper one is an example of a, what you could call a train track geometry, where you have two parallel nanowires that may be covered by a superconducting layer. And in the lower part, it's more like an Eiffel Tower where the uh, branches meet and, and form two wires that join. Um, in the center of the slide, you see uh, real images of such uh, constructions. For instance, this uh, double wire, um, that rises almost vertically from the substrate. Uh, the wires uh, have been separated. Then a layer of superconducting coating is deposited from the backside. And as you can see from the shadow, uh, there's material uh, projected through the gap between the wires, showing that they were actually separated until they were merged with the superconductor. Uh, in the lower part, you see these uh, merged double wires uh, that are fairly straight and regular. And if you make a cross section, you can see an example here of the intermarsenite wire with a superconducting coating around this uh, double wire structure. Uh, one could think that these are just accidental uh, findings on a big substrate, but the yield is actually pretty good. Uh, and just as a proof of that, uh, I show here a snapshot of a a part of a wafer uh, with around 400 sites for double wires. All the green ones, which is more than half of the sites, give rise to fairly well-defined double wires, while the red ones uh, have failed, uh, for instance, due to motion of the growth catalyst particle uh, during the growth process. Uh, but one can, with a decent yield, uh, obtain such double wires and actually also build these into devices 
just as a few examples are given here uh, of how one may incorporate train track and Eiffel Tower wires and different devices uh, with Josephson junctions and double dots with superconducting islands. It looks a bit like the setup needed for the topological condo effect uh, and also full shell superconducting uh, coatings on wires uh, where one can study, for instance, little parks oscillations in a more complex geometry than single parts. <clears throat> These systems are a bit beyond uh, the subject of, uh, of today's uh, conference, uh, but I'll just mention that there are papers coming out now uh, where these materials are employed in, in actual devices and studied by, by transport. You can also go to, to even higher uh, order arrays and extend the systems uh, using the same strategy. So that's one example of what you could call in situ uh, fabricated devices. Uh, as Eric Vargas indicated, uh, shaping the superconductor is also an issue. Uh, and one trick that is often used in, in fabrication of superconducting devices is uh, shadowing. Uh, and we have played a bit with that idea as well. Um, here you see just one example of how uh, one can form structures of metals on uh, vertical wires by having beams of uh, shadowing oxide put in front. Uh, Eric Parker showed the example of a flag standing in front of a wire. In this case, it's a, an oxide mask uh, at the surface of the substrate. An etched uh, trench forms the base for where the wires grow, defined by catalyst par par particles in, in the base. And then these uh, hanging wires, uh, the, the bridges in front, uh, gives rise to shadows when one deposits the, uh, the superconductor from uh, an angle uh, of say 45 degrees uh, to the substrate. Uh, in the center, you see some examples of the structures that can be realized, uh, symbol NS junctions that are needed for spectroscopy of, of proximitized wires, also Josephson junctions, superconducting islands, and even more complex devices um, shown below. This is work that was developed by Damon Karat, Martin Bjarfe, Thomas Esperson, and, and Thomas Kenne in, in my group. Um, and I think it's a good example of, of how we have taken uh, these relatively simple wires a step further by, by forming uh, much of the structure in, uh, in situ in the chamber. There are other very good examples from Eindhoven, Delft, Schulich, and, and also Microsoft in Copenhagen using different uh, strategies for making uh, shadow structuring of devices. Uh, one can even uh, transfer the concept to full shell wires where the wires are coated uh, 360 degrees around uh, by having uh, such shadow uh, bridges all around the wire and depositing from six different directions to get this uh, full shell wire with just a Josephson junction in the center. So um, that's a lot of uh, fabrication to go through. And the question is if the result is really better, do we get high performance by using such uh, structures? Uh, and the short answer is yes, this reduces the harm made to the wires uh, during uh, regular device fabrication where one may, may need to etch the superconductor to form uh, junctions, for instance. Um, and also to demonstrate that, uh, I'll just need to remind some of you about what you may see if you want to form a, a superconducting island on a nanowire. This is one of the papers shown in the first lecture today by Shankar uh, with a superconducting uh, proximitized uh, island of the nanowire showing 2e to 1e uh, transitions uh, in, in uh, charged uh, Coulomb spectroscopy. With aluminum, uh, one can see very nice, well-defined uh, 2e charging uh, of this superconducting island showing that uh, parity conservation in, in the island during transport. Um, the image to have in mind is uh, these well-known electrostatic parabola that indicates the energies of the states on, on such a, a finite metallic island as a function of the gate voltage. Uh, as long as the gap is large and there's a finite charging energy, it's only the 2e degeneracy points that gives rise to transitions. Um, However, if one can uh, lower states into the gap of the superconductor by 
for instance, application of a magnetic field, uh, one can arise in a situation where a gather uh, state at zero, energy gives rise to one E oscillations. And this was earlier taken as a signature of, of uh, zero energy bound states uh, on my Arana uh, features in this study by Albrecht in 2016. Um, the point is that these devices that are all fabricated uh, top down uh, often suffers from some instabilities due to the fabrication, uh, limiting the number of states that can be studied and studied and thus the statistics that can be performed on, on these uh, systems. Um, this was a device made by regular top down fabrication and I'll show next one performed uh, fabricated by shadow lithography. Uh, you see on top again an aluminum island connected to any mass might needs and normal contacts. Uh, the plot shows the uh, zero bias conductance as a function of the gate uh, and an external uh, applied magnetic field. You see 2E charging at zero field and a transition to some um, type of 1E patterns uh, at high field. Here are just a few tens of transitions, but I will, with just a simple animation, take you through, uh, through 400 states uh, of this device. Let's see how it goes. Uh, just to demonstrate how stable it is, here we can repeatedly scan the gate while stepping the magnetic field, and there's not a single switch in this entire spectrum uh, covering uh, around 400 charge uh, transitions uh, for the system. Uh, and that enables a new level of uh, transport spectroscopy where we can in detail follow the evolution of the, uh, the bifurcations from the 2E to the 1E uh, regime and also see how, for instance, couplings may involve uh, when changing the gate voltage and how one can change between different regimes. The behavior in this device is consistent with the Iran zero mode, but it's not necessarily uh, reflecting topology uh, as there are other reasons why my and one might have uh, near zero bias resonances, uh, as was already discussed this, this morning. Um, that was one example of an in, in situ fabrication, again, um, and also of studies of, of uh, these superconducting islands on, on nanowires. I'll now, now try to change gear a, bit, a little bit and go to transport uh, and, and, and maybe a more academic study of how uh, Islands can be affected by quantum dots. Um, it is well known that when we uh, form these, uh, say, Majorana islands, oftentimes uh, unintentional dots are formed in the region of the semiconductor close to, to the island uh, next to the contact, and that gives rise to some complications in the spectroscopy, and maybe even spurious uh, bound states uh, arising uh, in the transport characterization. This was illustrated, for instance, in, in the work by Ding in, in Science in 2016 that studied a, a proximitized wire, <coughs> wire with a dot coupled in the near the contact. We will now do this experiment in a very, uh, in a more controlled fashion uh, by studying a small superconducting island uh, with a significant charging energy coupled to a gate defined quantum dot uh, in the same uh, nanowire. This is uh, experimental work performed by Juan Carlos, Stardas Altisana, Alexandra Svikras, and, and, and Kasper Hover Rasmus. In my lab, uh, with help from uh, Oxid Group in, in Slovenia on modeling of the system. We heard about Shiba states earlier today in the discussion of STM work. Uh, and I'll use that as a contrast to what you'll meet in this system. So on the right-hand side, I showed just for um, illustration what might, one might see in systems where a quantum dot is coupled to a large superconducting reservoir. Uh, in that case, the quantum dot is basically an Anderson impurity with a single occupied state uh, that is screened by exchange by the coarser particles in the large superconducting reservoir, which is, by the way, grounded. So in that case, one uh, obtains these uh, bound states in the gap, the so-called Shiba states, or why Shiba Rusinov states, new Shiba Rusinov states, uh, and due to the 
electron hole symmetry of the superconductor, these are always symmetric in, in energy, giving rise to these highly symmetric uh, loop like structures in bias uh, spectroscopy and such. So that's uh, our reference system. On the left hand side is, is shown the system that we started today with the uh, now the finite superconductor in uh, Ireland, uh, with a significant charge energy comparable to the superconducting gap attached to a quantum dot on the side, which is again, a single uh, level impurity. Uh, so the system to have in mind is this single level coupled to a superconduct island uh, with pairing and uh, in quantized states filled by two n electrons. Um, now the final number of, of charges and the distribution of redistribution of charge between the dot and the uh, and the superconducting island breaks the symmetries uh, that we would otherwise have in the superconducting system. Uh, modeling uh, shows, for instance, that the, uh, the charge parabola uh, for this for the state, uh, the energy uh, uh, diagram for, for the state as a function of the gating of the superconductor now loses the symmetry that we usually have uh, for, uh, for superconducting uh, islands. You see an offset here. The thin lines represent the states when the island is coupled to the semiconducting dot. And the arrows shows the uh, transitions to the first excited state. Uh, and those are the transitions that may be probed in spectroscopy. So let's see how that should translate into a transport spectroscopy picture. Um, due to the lack of symmetry, uh, we no longer expect these uh, highly symmetric odd-like or loop-like structures that we know from super states, but rather highly skewed uh, S-like uh, transport resonances in nonlinear spectroscopy. Uh, so these are the uh, signatures that we'll be looking for in the uh, uh, transport that will come up next. So let's have a look at the experiment. So schematically, it's it's a serial double dot with a superconducting island and a a regular quantum dot on the side, and we can tune both by independent gate voltages. Um, the zero bias conductance diagram as a function of the gates looks like this. At a first glance, it could resemble the well-known honeycomb lattices that we know from double dot systems. Uh, but looking more closely, of course, we have 2E charging due to the superconductor. And also the jet energy points are not the usual triple points. In this case, they're even Quintuple points where five states are degenerate. So it's, it's a pretty different system from the, the regular double dot system. Um, the, I, sh I should point out that the charge numbers uh, indicating the occupation of the different uh, charge domains are only approximate as it's only the total charge of this hybridized system that is a, a good quantum number. So firstly, let's uh, establish whether this matches our uh, the model shown on the previous slide. Um, here is shown calculations done by our theoretical colleagues, Voxitus groups in, in Slovenia. These are numerical solutions of the Hamiltonian for the system uh, based on density matrix uh, renormalization group work. Uh, the output of the energy states from the model are overlaid on the experimental data and you see a very nice match. It's actually almost perfect uh, modeling of the, this uh, double island system with parameters uh, that matches exactly what is uh, deduced from the experimental spectroscopy. Mm. So the button seems to, to be a good match when it comes to studying just the ground states of the system. The question is if it also matches the, the spectroscopy spectroscopic measurements on the, uh, on the superconducting island. Uh, on the right hand, uh, right hand side is now shown the regular bias spectroscopy plot of uh, conductance, finite bias conductance as a function of soft strain bias and the gate tuning occupation of the normal dot uh, for a situation where the superconducting island is put in an even uh, parative region, so it should only contain Cooper pairs. You see, Different features here, for instance, there's inversion symmetry around the point where the, uh, the semiconducting dot is uh, 
has electron hole symmetry in the center of this uh, charged domain. And there are also interesting discontinuities in the spectrum, for instance, when cross section, uh, the, the, the graph state change happens, it gives rise to some change of, of intensity to the states in the continuum. Uh, at least we can conclude this is very far from the eye-like shaped uh, patterns we expect if this behaved like a Sheba state. Again, modeling uh, gives a very nice match. In fact, with the same parameters as, as shown in the previous slide, uh, we can map out the excitation spectrum of this uh, hybridized uh, dot superconducting island system uh, very well. Making us believe that it's actually a proper representation of the, the system. Um, now I will just briefly discuss how this behaves in field. Of course, it's interesting to study the behavior and the evolution in the finite field, bearing in mind that we are looking for uh, zero modes and uh, resonances at finite fields in these hybridized and approximatized wires. This is data at 0.3 Tesla, where the Siemens splitting is significant. Uh, the charge domains are now split by the Siemens splitting. Again, we have a perfect match to the uh, theoretical model. Uh, we can also deduce the spin of the different states. Uh, we find out that triplet states matter. Uh, without going into too much detail, I'm, I'm just flashing uh, the transport spectroscopy diagrams in this case when tuning the superconducting island uh, gate charge at zero fields and at a finite field of uh, 0.25 Tesla. What we do notice is that uh, at a finite field, some excitations uh, enter the superconducting gap. Uh, and by matching to the modeling, we can actually see that these are triplet states. Uh, and uh, if one has experience in studying uh, transport spectroscopy, one can follow this state as it moves towards uh, zero energy at a finite field when cranking up the field. This may not be totally convincing uh, when running this fast uh, animation. So rather than trying to convince you based on data, I'll rather discuss the concept uh, from some schematic diagrams. And you have to believe me that this is a, a good representation of that, what happens in, in, in the experiment. Uh, so I study here the, the system of the Suvanakin Island connected to a dot. Uh, at a finite field where the green states, the triplet excited states, begin to move towards the center of the, uh, this charge uh, domain. Uh, at some field, uh, they catch up with the, uh, the single states and they become a degenerate uh, graph state transition. Uh, and at that position, that's exactly when we have 1E charging. So a transition from 2E to 1E charging lower pure. Uh, it can also be represented by an energy diagram as the one shown to the, to the right here, uh, at low field and at this particular degeneracy point. Uh, this is in a way trivial, right? This is excited states with a higher spin that reaches uh, lower energy and becomes a ground state. This has nothing to do with the topological transitions. Yet it's interesting to, to speculate a bit about how uh, superconducting proximitized islands behave if they were topological. Um, so now we show below at least schematically a hybridized wire with uh, two Majorana end modes. Uh, we know that these arises when the uh, induced gap uh, in the island uh, reaches uh, zero energy uh, at a finite field. So at that uh, position one uh, arrives at the topological state and have the, the 1E transition that uh, uh, was taken as a signature of, of Majorana zero uh, modes in, in, in these uh, hybridized uh, superconducting islands. Uh, and again, I, I don't want to say that these are the same phenomena, but in a finite field, uh, they can somehow look the, the same and, and that can be seen in, in data on this uh, totally non-topological system. And now I show data in a more strong coupling regime. This is a stability diagram for the dot uh, superconducting island system uh, at, at finite field. Uh, now the 
the honeycombs or the charge domains are more distorted due to the stronger coupling. Uh, but it's still interesting to have a look at the spectroscopy. For instance, uh, fixing the gate at one particular field where we have clear, even or not, uh, signatures in the charging when sweeping the superconducting uh, islands gate. Um, here's has shown the data at, at, at zero field. And uh, as we crank up the field towards a finite value, uh, at some point we arrive this, uh, at this transition uh, where the triplet state takes part in the ground state transition. Uh, and we have uh, uh, the even and the odd uh, Coulomb uh, valleys uh, attaining the same spacing. Uh, by surprise, actually, when increasing the field even further, this uh, even odd symmetry remains, um, even at, at, at a fairly large uh, field value. This is shown uh, here where we just see a plot of the, uh, the spacings as a functional field, and for some reason, uh, the spacing uh, for the even or not tends to, to stick to the same value rather than splitting due to the human effect. Uh, this is actually not expected from the model. It may uh, arise from the fact that higher order states uh, arise uh, closer to zero and, and uh, makes uh, the bound state uh, or the triple state and the ground state stick at, at zero energy. Uh, Phenomenologically, this can look similar to what one might find in, in, uh, in other superconducting islands. Uh, and it just serves to illustrate that one should be careful when, uh, when deducing from spectroscopy like this, uh, that one has a topological transition uh, in the system. Yet again, I'm, I'm not necessarily claiming that this is what is seen in other experiments, but it's at least showing that a, that a trivial system can give rise to signatures that were not quite expected. Uh, in such spectroscopy. Good. Let me just conclude on, on this part of the talk, which was, was a bit off track from the materials science. Uh, let me just briefly say that we have good evidence of, of a new type of bound states, of subgap states found when coupling a superconductor island to a quantum dot. Uh, they show this uh, highly asymmetric spectrum. Uh, triplet states matter. We see 1E charging uh, and so forth. This work uh, is on, on the archive and, and also matching very nicely the modeling by Rox group. And I refer you to those uh, preprints for further details. Now, um, let me return to the material science and some of the issues we raised at the beginning about uh, super semiconductor hybrids. And at the end, I would like to show some results on, on that. Uh, which is quite an interesting superconductor in, in uh, combination with uh, various semiconductors. And of course, the motivation for going into this direction is, is the, the quest for, for superconductors that may enhance the topological gap as compared to aluminum, which is otherwise a, a favorite material. Uh, the work uh, shown in this part was uh, run to a large extent by PhD student Thomas Kanner and other students, Dax Olstein, Smithers. And also, and transport measurements were handled by Damon Karat, Joachim Sistoff, and Kasper Rasmussen from my group. Lead is not the only uh, high field, uh, high critical temperature superconductor considered. And, uh, for instance, there was work recently done by uh, collaboration between the previous speaker, Chris Palstrom, and, and Sergey Frolov on tin on. Uh, indium and timonite wires, similar to wires seen in the previous talk. That can also give rise to a, a hard gap in spectroscopy with the uh, two order magnitude suppression uh, within the gap, just as seen for aluminum, but in this case with a larger gap. Uh, and also signatures of 2E to 1E transitions uh, for superconducting ions. Uh, so the superconducting features are strong. Uh, but it has a complication that, that uh, there are two phases, alpha and beta, and only one of them is superconducting, uh, which makes some of the features in spectroscopy a, little, a, a bit more uncertain. Um, uh, there are other uh, evol evolutions in, in this area, and also interesting work recently from the groups in the Netherlands on, on aluminum uh, platinum multilayers. 
Um, but we stick with uh, indium arsenide, and thus that brings me back to the discussion of, of what materials that may match um, indium arsenide contextually. We already know aluminum. Um, others that, based on modeling, could match aluminum, uh, may match indium arsenide, would be uh, indium, tallium, uh, and lead, possibly also others. But these are some of the candidates for superconductors that, at least on Pure structural modeling uh, could make a good match to uh, indium arsenide. Indium goes like that. It does not really wet the surface. Uh, even at, uh, during, uh, during uh, low temperature depositions, one gets pearls on the string of indium droplets uh, on the indium arsenide wire. Um, occasionally, uh, the crystalline match can be pretty good. Uh, but again, this is not. Uh, the desired structure for extended proximity surface. Uh, tallium, well, you may not have worked with that and neither have, have we. It is a superconductor. Uh, it's also radioactive. And if you search the internet, uh, people would claim that it's the most toxic metal uh, and also not a, a nice material to handle in, in the growth system. We have not uh, addressed that. One yet, but lead uh, as the last one on this list is, is actually attractive and indeed the type one elements of superconductor with the highest TC and worth pursuing. There's been earlier transport experiments on quantum devices uh, incorporating lead. Here's one example of a, a nanotube device with lead contacts. This is from Christian Schoenberger's group in Basel in Switzerland, um, doing spectroscopy and studying uh, subcap states in nanotubes using lead and uh, that's another bunch of nanotube work uh, shown below. Also on uh, nanowires work by the uh, groups uh, PISA and Italy have uh, addressed indium arsenide wires contacted by lead electrodes, uh, giving a, a high supercurrent. Uh, but yet these experiments are not relying on in situ formed hybrid nanowires. And that's uh, indeed our target, uh, to grow the hybrids in the growth chamber and not having to put the superconductor uh, by clean room processing uh, outside in the ambient. So how does it go with, uh, with lead? Here uh, is one example of a indium arsenide wire with the lead evaporated on two facets on the side at low temperature, 10 nanometers of lead. Uh, evaporated by E beam in evaporation. It seems pretty smooth. Uh, a cross section shows a profile like this in the indium arsenide core and the lead coating on the side. Uh, and if you do high resolution electron microscopy, uh, it's actually a pretty good match with the indium arsenide side matching the, uh, the lead crystal uh, on the right hand side, such that one unit cell of, of indium arsenide matches two. Uh, planes of, <clears throat> of, of lead uh, with a mismatch that's below 1%. This is also confirmed by, by modeling. Um, it turns out that lead can only exist in, in one structure, uh, in one orientation, all along the wire. So you have to imagine that along this micron long nanowire is actually a single lead grain all the way down one facet another grain on the other facet. Uh, they merge in a pretty nice fashion, um, as shown on the right-hand side. This is a zoom in a cross-section like what you see on the left, showing the corner, two facets of the intermass night wire and the lead crystal on the side. Both cases, nice atomic matching on the side. Uh, and then a wedge shape or triangular shape grain uh, are inserted in order to make these two grains, one and two, uh, fuse uh, around the corner of the nanowire. But it's a very nice match indeed. Uh, and actually, as uh, I just mentioned, a single uh, extended grain all along the nanowire with no grain boundaries, unlike one, what one finds, for instance, when uh, evaporating aluminum uh, on the internal The transverse match. Uh, equivalent to a view on uh, the top of the wires is very good as well uh, with the uh, two cells of uh, intermarsonite matching three uh, planes of, of lead. 
If this is complex to you, let me show it in a more uh, illustrative uh, representation. Uh, now you have to uh, ignore the uh, cool pairs flying on the side. They are, of course, uh, an artist impression of the Sukhanovning interface, uh, but the rest is actually reality. Uh, this is a composition of the electron microscopy images of the indium arsenide wire, its top facet seen in a cross section, and the lead crystal on the side. Uh, and it serves to illustrate that along the wire we have the good match on the top, we do as well. Uh, and actually, within these segments, there are absolutely no defects uh, over extended ranges. So it, it is a very nice match, uh, at least for thin layers of lead uh, attached. Or coding uh, on the uh, on the semiconductor. I showed a 10 nanometer coding. In this case, it's 15 and 30 nanometers uh, work nice as well. The surface seems to be almost atomically flat, uh, unless we go to extreme layers above 50 nanometers, then we get a more bulky structure. How about transport? Uh, the rest of the talk, the last few minutes, I will just give some uh, examples of uh, transport spectroscopy. In this case, it's a simple NS junction where a uh, normal region is used as a ton barrier to do spectroscopy of the proximitized area. Spectroscopy is shown on the right at zero field and at finite field, in this case of seven, seven Tesla shown by red. Uh, we see again something that looks like a, a hard gap. Uh, it's probably a pretty metallized wire, but yet it is spectroscopy of the uh, of the hybrid hybrid wire, and, and the gap remains for these thin uh, lead films even at, at really high fields. Seven test is pretty extreme in this case, and, uh, and we see a gap remaining even at eight and a half Tesla for thin films. The gap remains at temperatures of a few Kelvin. This is a temperature uh, dependence of the uh, uh, spectroscopy of the, the gap. And you see signatures uh, even at six or seven, uh, seven Kelvin for this uh, high gap, high critical temperature superconductor which that constitutes. On the right hand side is, is a magnetic field dependence uh, showing the gap as it shrinks at fields uh, approaching nine Tesla. The features outside uh, are Coulomb resonances arising in the uh, normal segment between the, the metal electrode and the, uh, the hybrid nanowire. Mm -hmm. This is just one device. We have performed extensive spectroscopy on, on sets of devices. Here's shown data for six different devices, uh, all showing a hard gap, a dark region in the center, a low bias below the gap. Uh, and then uh, shoulders, including resonances, but interestingly also subgap states are rising. In this case, by accident in these uh, spectroscopic devices uh, with features in the gap, uh, also exotic ones looking like uh, Shiba states or Andrea Baum states. Here's a, on the top right panel, uh, there's a zoom in one of these where we have enhanced the uh, features in the gap showing uh, an exotic uh, spectrum of subgap states that, that we are now uh, pursuing uh, in more detailed studies. Finally, uh, one can also make superconducting islands based on the lead. Here's uh, one device with an island of a few hundred nanometers uh, that is supposed to behave just like the ones I discussed at the beginning of this, uh, this talk. Uh, bias spectroscopy shown to the right with 2E charging proving that we do have parity conservation also for lead, uh, as seen for aluminum. Uh, at high bias, uh, of course, outside the gap, we have 1E transport, quasi uh, particles are, uh, are populated, quasi particle states are populated, uh, but uh, still it, it uh, constitutes a very nice one of the island. It's natural to ask what kind of spectroscopy in a Spectroscopy features would say it field. Uh, I'll just focus on, on the uh, on this, this uh, uh, map in the center where we show Coulomb resonances, the 2E charging, and how it develops into 1E uh, at a finite field. 
There are very uh, there are many different regimes that can be uh, assessed in, in, in this way, and uh, I will not go into detail now. But at least it's illustrating the prospects for lead that we do have parity conservation and also the transition to HP in field, and all this can be understood in in this super nothing island picture that I introduced at the beginning. I'll skip uh, this part. This brings me to my last uh, announcements. Uh, I already introduced the teams as we went along with the transport group, the uh, shadow and in situ fabrication team, and also those that did the growth, in particular Thomas Kerner and people involved in the lead studies. We have had modeling uh, assistance from Roxitko's group in, in Ljubljana, but also in, in many other experiments. Uh, Essential modeling from uh, Jens Paske and, and Gorm Stephenson in, in the theory group in our center. Um, I showed this one at the beginning, listing issues that were to be addressed. I addressed some of these, including the superconducting shell, how to improve the interfaces and minimizing the damage, but we are not through yet. Um, we covered a, a good way. Uh, and introduce some new materials. And with that, I'll end my talk and just uh, put up a slide with conclusions, uh, some ideas for further further work, and the three main topics I discussed, the superconducting islands, in situ fabrication, and finally lead as a new superconductor in these uh, pre five hybrids. Otherwise, uh, and with that, I, I thank you for your uh, attention. Okay, thanks. thanks a lot for this very nice talk. And uh, I think we, Got a question from uh, Dr. Bakers. Hi, it's Bernd. <laughs> really super nice results. Thanks a lot. Very nice talk. I basically have two questions. So, so one about the first part about the, the growth. And that question is, so what is the mechanism that leads to the joining of these two nanowires? That's a simply a Van der Waals attachment. Uh, so they're grown pretty close together in that case. Uh, they are also long and rather thin, so they're flexible. And some uh, at some point during the growth, I cannot say exactly when, due to vibrations at high temperature, they uh, they touch and stick. So that's plainly van der Waals section. Uh, and then they remain stuck uh, in that configuration also during the middle evaporation. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Uh, my second question is about the lead on the indium arsenide. So you have shown uh, the magnetic field dependency. On these devices, but you don't see any zero bias peak there. And um, well, the, the main question is why? <laughs> I mean, you would expect it, isn't it? We don't see, but now you refer to the uh, to the uh, NS spectroscopy uh, yep. data. Yeah, so we just see the the gap. We see subgap states in a not very systematic uh, manner, but not as long as your bias peak. I don't have a, we have not pursued intensive spectroscopy. Of course, it's quite interesting to, to try to optimize these devices and, and look for uh, for states sticking at zero bias, but that has not been the case in, in this first generation of devices. Uh, it's a good question. It's worth pursuing for sure. Lushing, I have some questions. Sure. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Are you talking to me, Lushing? Uh, yes. Yeah, so I actually have three questions here, per se, not connected to each other. Well, I have many, but I have chosen to ask three. The first one is the same one I asked Eric. As you know, in these nano words, it's very difficult to have a single estimate of disorder, which I found very useful in my 2D semiconductor work. I mean, you know. It's not very accurate, but it gives an idea. So mobility is reasonable, not perfect, but reasonable. So do you have any idea for your mobilities for the Mirana experimental samples? Mobility no, I, 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 energy. I need both, just knowing mobility is not good enough. Yeah, I, I, I realized during your, your talk, the uh, demanding uh, requirement on 10 to the 15th of the impurity in the semiconductor and such, and I, I don't have numbers. Let's not worry it's about matching that, that uh, but uh, we will surely try to, to come up with some estimates now. We have mobility estimates that, that matches what is seen in many other people's experiment on in your mass night wires. So it's about 20 or so, but I don't have a, a density to, to provide. No, no, what is the mobility? Uh, your, what is your estimate? 20,000? What would be your estimate? 
No, it's 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 uh, typically below ten thousand for these these wires. And what would you what would be a best guess for your carrier density? I mean, so it's change with dating, but I'm talking about when they put the wire on the superconductor. Does the does the uh, native carrier the native doping? Yeah, I'm I'm afraid I'm afraid I don't have a number to give you. Uh, stay by by heart. Um, we, but, we, but, we can get it out from the mobility estimates, of course, and, and the, the okay. field effect okay. behavior. Uh, okay. But I don't have a number in, in my head. Okay. That's particular. not a problem. My second question is uh, about the Ushiva uh, Rosanna uh, story, which I like very much. But I am, I mean, this is a semantic question, okay? But, but I just want to make sure that I understand. I think I'm understanding the physics you're describing. But I do not quite understand why you're calling it YSR. To me, YSR is that you put a magnetic impurity and you find a subgap state. That's YSR. Uh, but of course, it's you know generalized YSR. They're all undraped states, right? So I'm just trying to understand the terminology. Why aren't you calling it undraped, for example? Well, I, I, I would say in general they belong to the class of undraped bound states. But in a particular case with a single end of some impurity and a superconducting reservoir, it, it's equivalent to a Shiba state arising from impurity right. in a superconducting, but, you, but, but not, for, not for the states that I present here with the finite superconducting island, and that would not be a Shiba, and just the lack of symmetry shows that, right? Yeah, I have no problem with that, you know, mm -hmm. the terminology is terminology, you are at liberty to choose your terminology for your paper, but I just want to make sure I'm understanding it, but you don't think you have any magnetic impurity, do you? I mean, there is no magnetic impurity in this problem, right? No, no. Okay. And then, then I understand everything. No, I'm not going to... I'm not going to argue over, over semantics. I mean, as long as I understand. And no, my last question, of semantics, I agree, yeah. <laughs> yeah. My last question is uh, kind of like, almost would sound sociological, but I am going to ask it because, you know, I used to visit Copenhagen quite often until I started criticizing Charlie's papers and <laughs> I didn't visit as much. Uh, you have no connection to Microsoft, right? Your lab is completely different. You are in QDev. But you I mean, in QDEV, and I, uh, I had my lab before QDEV was started. Right. Uh, of course, we are working together. So I would not say these are, you, you mentioned that there are two groups. I would say we have several groups in Copenhagen. They are many of those in QDEV, and we work together sometimes and sometimes separately. A lot of the development was done jointly and also with people from Microsoft, but, yeah, but sure. of course, also separate directions, as I have shown here. So. But you're not part of the Microsoft team there. I mean, Microsoft has an official team there. You're not part of that, right? No, not, a, not at all. Yeah. No. That's all I'm asking. No, I, mean, I mean, we all have some connection to Microsoft, obviously. Sure. Yeah. That's the point. But I just wanted to know, yeah, that's it. Uh, those are my main questions. I think both what you and Eric and Peter Cox were trying to do Mike Manfra, I made it very clear, that's the only way we're going to go anywhere. And this is exactly what I faced when I was trying to work with Mike Friedman and Chetan Nayak, you know, trying to make uh, the five half mayor on a qubit. They had also the main thing was Lauren Pfeiffer improving sample quality. And now all those things have come back, you know, now in this, yeah, yeah. this system. Totally. Exactly I think we all system. agree that the materials engineering is, is, is essential uh, for progress here. Yes. And you are doing heroic work. Thank you very much. Very good talk. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe let me just ask a question, a very naive question regarding the last part of this uh, epitaxial growth of the of the lead. Uh, I'm just curious because uh, I think it, so. So, are, are for the next step, are you going to try to like tune the gate voltage or change the magnetic field to see if we can achieve a topological transition in the wires in order to uh, to to get some Marana signature in that case. If we are going to, um, well, we are certainly exploiting these devices. I, what I didn't mention is the hassle getting from the wires to operating devices because lead is is not ideal when it comes to handling in in, in a clean room. I mean, it dissolves in water, for instance, and it oxidizes in air. So we spend most of the time just arriving at working devices. Uh, so the transport characterization is limited so far, uh, uh, but of course it's 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 highly interesting to try to to reconstruct recon devices and geometries as as we know from all the other experiments. Uh, absolutely, but uh, I've basically showed them all this, uh, the more the the data we have is is what I've shown here at least uh, similar to what I've shown today. I see. Thanks. Um, so Hi, Jay. Uh, yeah. yeah, maybe. So, uh, so just, just this is might be related to um, 
Uh, and uh, uh, the question that Eric asked. Uh, so, so in, in the data on your lead, can we go back to it? I mean, I guess the magnetic field basically did nothing to the gap for the range that you looked. I mean, there were subgap states, but the but there st still seemed to be a gap feature. Or maybe I was looking at the wrong data. Oh, this yeah, so, is the one. Sorry. I, I, uh -huh. This is field data uh, for an NS. Uh, Junction where we see nothing in the gap, basically, uh, right. even uh, yeah. up to pretty high fields. Then, when I showed the uh, spectroscopy data with the subgap states, that was not a magnetic field dependence, that was uh, the gate dependence here. Uh, this uh, is uh, only gate spectroscopy. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, good. So, uh, oh, this all this is at, yeah, at yeah, zero I, field. I, I, uh -huh. This is at zero field. Yeah. Right. Right. This is all at zero field. And there, so I guess uh, the, the good news then is that, yeah, so I guess this, this will tolerate, uh, for the positive spin is it'll tolerate a lot of magnetic field, I guess. Yeah, the that, superconductor, that's unlike exactly aluminum. the thin layer of, of, of lead does in, indeed. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's a table here in the lower uh, right corner actually showing uh, critical fields uh, for different thicknesses determined from our ratio. Right, but it's it's really but even at eight point five, you barely have any suppression of the magnetic field uh, of of the gap. It's uh, the gap seems to be almost the same. Yeah, for this film, yeah. film film device, yeah, which is yeah. quite surprising. Yeah, it's it's impressive. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, okay, any other questions? Uh, if not, let's uh, let's thank uh, Dr. Nagar. Uh, for this very wonderful talk, and uh, um, and uh, thanks a lot. Uh, and uh, then I think we we still have like a, a like three minutes for the uh, for a very short break. And uh, I would I think the next uh, I think Yanji, you are the you are you are you are chairing the next speaker, right? No, that's me. Oh, it's Danny. Okay, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> okay, then I will pass on the the chair to, to you. All right. Thanks, Raishing. Um, so yeah, let's just take a couple minutes break uh, before the next talk by Professor Wiesenberg. 